Hello, everybody, and welcome to Vulcan Boldly Going. Our speaker today is Hugh Glover. Hugh is the Vulcan Technical Director. Hugh, take it over. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this session. Uh, I see a few familiar faces, but also lots of new faces. So what I'm aiming to do today is, is run back over what we've done in the last uh, two years, two and a bit years since Vulcan started up. A fire has always been a source of, of bad jokes and puns. Um, when you call a, an accelerator Vulcan, I'm afraid you get an awful lot of Star Trek uh, illusions going on in here as well. So if you're not a Trekkie, it's probably all go over your head, but um, hopefully there'll be odd bits here and there that might just raise a faint tingle. So let's go on. So I did a presentation at Dev Days in 2020. And this is one of the slides that I took from that. Uh, the point we were making then is that clinical care and clinical research really exist in parallel universes. Um, things kind of sort of look the same, but often the subtle differences and sometimes not so subtle differences that people trip over and, and partly what I want to pick up on is some of the ways in which we've identified those points where people trip up um, and also point out those that still exist and, and still where we're going. Um, I think assuming you understand what something is just because it looks like something you've seen before uh, can actually lead to, to difficulty with these things. This is the other slide from two years ago, um, still relevant. It's talking about the, the overall business process. Um, and I'm going to use this as the, the backdrop uh, to the presentations as I walk through them um, so that we can put things in, in some sort of context. So I'll explain a bit more about this slide uh, a little later. So if, if you don't know, the first question I should answer is what is Vulcan? Well, Vulcan is one of the HL7 accelerators. There are, I think, eight different accelerators now. And the idea behind all of them uh, is to pick up on a specific area of interest uh, and try and make the whole thing run a little bit faster. Uh, HL7 as a community is a, a wonderful volunteer community. But whether you're a volunteer or, or as some people say, voluntold, uh, it's still dependent on how much time people can give to it, essentially off the side of the desk. Um, so it tends to be done in an hour or two hours on a Friday afternoon um, or, or uh, you know, a, a particularly quiet time. It makes it difficult to put a project plan in place makes it difficult to get things done to a specific timeline. The accelerators came into existence to focus on particular areas and bring some resource in the sense of people and finance uh, to be able to make things go more rapidly. Uh, Vulcan is here to do that for clinical research and to try and bridge some of that gap uh, between the the parallel universes that I mentioned earlier. So this is the, the coverage we have within the organizations in Vulcan. So we've got the standards development organizations, the government agencies, we've got some patient involvement, we've got the, the technology vendors, we've got academics, and we've got all the industry groups. So that's um, pharma, it's the um, bio, biopharma people, it's the CROs, so any one of the, the industry sections that are in there. Um, we are at the moment somewhat US focused. Um, that's partly a consequence of where and when we got established. I think it's also partly a consequence of the disruption of the last two years where we intended to have events uh, really around the world and that proved not to be possible. But we're currently standing at about 40 different members. So really quite a good uh, range of, 
uh, involvement uh, in the different projects. So the question is, what are the projects? What are we running at the moment? <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, this is a set of projects. Um, I'm going to talk through most of these. I'm not particularly going to talk about FINA packets today, nor am I going to talk about the, the sample data project. Um, but we, we cover a range of different activities. What I'm going to do is go through each of these, um, tell you a bit about what the project's trying to deal with, put it in that overall context, and talk about the, the work that's been done over the last two years. So all of that needs that context. And this is the drawing I was showed you earlier from two years ago. Um, the middle pieces in the, the purple are different threads of processes that go on. So things like uh, finding investigators, finding sites, finding subjects, all part of the basic management of a study. The screening, the randomization, providing the the, the trial medications, all of that are a process of logistics that goes on. Then there's the, the actual data capture, uh, where we, we're getting results back from the study. And then there's unscheduled things that happen, you know, life happens. Um, those might be called adverse events, there may be other sorts of things, but all those things get threaded together as a, a series of steps. The data gets stored, it gets integrated together. There's, there's a set of things that get part of this. Um, so we've got obviously subjects in trials, we've got investigators running them. We're, we've got plans as to how things are gonna happen. We cover the regulators, we cover the products themselves. And when we put all those things together, we've got to do some analysis on it. Uh, and part of that analysis will end up in submission to one of the regulators, um, that, that being part of the process of clinical research. And all the time there's this parallel process running um, in the parallel universe, which is the clinical care going on, which has got data going into the EHR uh, through a variety of different systems. And obviously the business processes that happen down here in the clinical care um, are at least as complicated, if not more so, uh, than the ones that are happening in the clinical research. So what things have we, we actually worked on in the last two years? So this is the, the list of projects that we had on the earlier slide. Um, so in, in, I think, the order that I'm going to go through them, we've got schedule of activities. Schedule of activities has an impact on things. It has an impact on visits. We've got real world data. It has an impact uh, on EHR. It has an impact on submissions. We've got adverse event reporting, uh, which obviously ties back to that adverse event element. We've got a fire to OMOP, which is trying to help the analysis process. And we've got electronic product information, which is trying to manage the, the data that goes around uh, in the background for the products. So schedule activities, uh, this is one of our original projects. Um, they've been through Connectathon three times now, um, two project leads on Mike Ward and Jeff Lowe. Um, and I can see Jeff staring at me from a, a video clip uh, further down on the screen. So what is schedule activities about? Um, very simplistically, um, this is too small to read, so I'm gonna be brave. I've never tried this in a live presentation, but hopefully you can now see an enlarged version of the screen. This grid here is typically the way in which what happens in a study uh, gets documented at present. Um, looks like a spreadsheet, it's often held in a spreadsheet, but it's a series of activities on this column, and then a series of occasions when they're supposed to happen. Um, these are typically described as weak numbers. Um, so this is week, week two, week four, week six, week minus three is, uh, no, minus 0.3 is three days before, week minus two is two weeks before. So 
if there's an X in the box, whatever is on this side uh, is what should be done. So the point behind this uh, project was to say, well, can we represent this in a fire form? And if you're any sort of a fire expert, you all sort of said, well, yeah, of course you can. It, it's all fairly straightforward. Um, and indeed it is. Um, what we went through is, is collecting that and being able to represent this um, all through activity definitions to, to get the detail in there. So yes, it is a, a relatively simple process, relatively. Um, but one of the problems is that when something is relatively simple, there's usually multiple ways of doing it. If there are multiple ways of doing it, it will get done in multiple ways. And if it gets done in multiple ways, we don't achieve that interoperability. So this is the, the plan as we pulled out. So um, I'm not going to say a lot about this track. Um, I'm sure one reason Jeff's here is because he wants to, to check what I'm actually saying about his project. Um, and that's because he's got a separate track uh, within this dead days where he's going to dive into stuff in, in a good deal more detail. So uh, I absolutely don't want to steal any of his thunder uh, by going into a lot of detail on anything. Um, and he's more of an expert than I am anyway. But I would point out that schedule activities has to represent a whole string of the things that are on this side. So the design, the schedule activities itself uh, and the subject trial plan. So how do you go from this generalized schedule of week two, week three, week four to something that's specific dates for a specific patient? How do you represent the, the activities that are going on in here? Um, you saw vital signs on the previous one. How do we go through and make sure that all of the representation of what we're going to do is done in a consistent way? And it also has to span, and it's a very small arrow, so it's hard to see on here, but it also spans the activities that go on within the clinical care as well, not just what goes on in the, the trial. So it's a real... Um, universal project and, and really one of the reasons for having it as a as a prime starter. So the next one of the, the, the projects that was a, really a founding Vulcan project was the real world data one. Again, starting in October 2020. Um, again, been through three uh, connectathons. Scott Gordon is the project lead and goodness I look down and I can see Scott Gordon's here as well so they're all keeping track of whether I'm telling the truth or not. So the thing about real world data is well you know I, I warned you that the Star Trek references yeah it's data gem but not as we know it. Um, I was quite fond of Alice Through the Looking Glass uh, when I was a child. It was that sort of slightly bizarre world that she went into. And this is an illustration from the, the original publication, uh, which is Alice peering through the mirror and looking at the world on the other side, which sort of looks just the same. And yet when she went through, she found that things didn't work the same. Things are all back to front. Um, Data reflects the context in which it is captured. Um, I think that's probably a mantra that I'd like to see people uh, forced to repeat three times before breakfast every day, um, because it is so crucial to what we do. And if we lose track of that, we end up not using data in an appropriate manner, even though we think we are. So, making use of the real world data, it, it's about the context. Um, was this data actually collected to be used in the way that we now intend to use it or not? And that I think is the ultimate challenge around what we're trying to do with real world data. It fits over here in that it takes data out of our EHR. It takes data and puts it in the context context remember 
of the particular sets of visits that are going on. So how does this tie into that process? And is the data that we're collecting particularly of use? Because what we will ultimately want to do is be able to make a submission uh, on the basis of that data and improve our confidence in the results of that submission uh, when it actually goes forwards. And of course, scheduled activities uh, fall back into this because scheduled activities is what tells us when visit one is actually happening for a specific patient. And this EHR data is being collected for a specific patient. So these two projects really are, are quite closely tied together. You know, to give a flavor of the, the sort of challenges that we've tried to tackle in this, if you go back to the fire documentation and you go into the section that talks about medication management, you'll find these four resources there. So medication request, medication dispense, medication administration, and medication usage. Um, they're part of a workflow really, and the, the overall concept is that you start with a medication request. I would like the patient to receive the following medication. That results in a medication dispense. The medication dispense happens. That means you've got some medication there, you can give it to the patient, and that gets recorded as part of a medication administration. Um, but you also get people coming in and say, oh, my, my Auntie Bessie takes the small green tablets um, and you record what those are and those go in through a medication usage, um, which used to be known as medication statement. So you've got this fairly nice workflow. So yeah, we're going to find that in an EHR, aren't we? We, we went off and looked um, and pulling in uh, some fairly genuine EHR records from vendor systems, we found that in practice, out of these four resources, they only ever actually use one of them. Um, and different systems use a different one out of those sets. So this whole sense that we know what we're going to look for um, and we can find this nice workflow and we can pull the stuff out from that, um, really it was, one of those, ah, no, it doesn't work like that moments. That brings us back to context again. Because in a, an EHR, if I'm going back and looking at the record for a patient and saying, well, what's this patient been on? And I see a medication request in there. I know that at least somebody felt it was appropriate for a patient to be given let's say exoticillin for a, a made up drug it was appropriate for them to be given exoticillin at some point that tells me something about that patient it helps with my diagnosis it helps me with my care of that patient it is reasonably valid data uh, and some systems will say yeah it's fine you can take that as uh, gospel truth that uh, that patient did receive that particular medication. But suppose now we're trying to interpret that record for the sake of making a submission. Um, is that now a valid assumption? We don't actually know whether that patient took that on the basis of a medication request. The only real firm evidence we got is a medication administration that says, I give this patient this medication on this date. So the context here changes the balance of what is a reasonable thing to assume uh, as a minimum, if you like, a minimum viable set of data to collect. So the sequence this project has gone through uh, over the course of its two years, its three connectathons, is uh, to start off by looking at EHRs for concurrent medication. Uh, and discovering the, the difficulties that were inherent in that process. Part of the submission process is to convert that data into SDTM because that's uh, what the FDA expects to receive. There was a lot of difficulty in finding sample data um, and somebody had the, the ingenious idea, though I confess I had to think about it at first, 
um, which is to take a set of SDTM data and reverse engineer it back into a set of fire records. Um, and then using the processes that have been identified before to look for concurrent modification and then regenerate that SDTM. Um, it sounds like a, a circular process and, and that's exactly what it is. It, it is demonstration that you can round trip that data. And if you can't round trip that data, then this circumstance has got to be the easiest possible one to make that happen. You certainly can't guarantee that you're going to achieve it elsewhere. That did demonstrate that it was practical to round trip this data. And they're now in the process of generating the, the first draft of an implementation guide, which is due for publication in January 2023. And that's going to cover uh, questions like what data items are actually essential? What should we make sure is being put into the EHR if we really want to get data out of it? So how can we look at an EHR and say, could I use this for collecting data from it? That involves generating some appropriate fire profiles uh, and general guidance. There's an issue with this project, and that issue is lack of sample data, um, multiply lack of sample data, lack of it from the perspective of the detail of what data actually goes in there. So can you pull specific items out? But also lack of sample data as to how people build systems in the real world, um, how they're actually put together. Um, so finding good data for testing these processes has been uh, a real challenge. But let's move on to adverse events. This is one of the new projects starting in October. It's done one connectathon. Um, Michelle Kasagni is the lead. So again, back to context. Um, what is an adverse event? I've been part of the discussions within HL7 about adverse events for probably something like five years. And we've had the same conversations going round and round and round and round because of differences in context between the different perspectives. And I've tried to very briefly summarize this here uh, as part of an example. This can be a common side effect. Um, so mice, the imaginary drug exoticillin, yeah, people always feel nauseous after they've taken exoticillin. It's expected. It's not an adverse event as part of your clinical care process. But if you're doing clinical research, that is something that needs to be recorded. Uh, anything that's not, not what you expect and which is not a good thing, whatever a good thing might be interpreted to be, is something that has to be recorded. So this is again a case where the context of the data uh, has a big impact upon the, the way in which it can be used uh, and what it actually means. This is our overall pattern again. And there are really four threads within adverse event reporting. There's the question about the resource definition itself. Then there's how you actually set about reporting stuff. You can have people say, well, I think I've just experience an adverse event and want to tell somebody about it. That spontaneous reporting that can come from clinicians or it can come from patients or patients' families. If you're running a trial, then that will have provision in it for, uh, for actually providing the formal reporting of specific sets of adverse events they're particularly interested in. So it's a different way of doing things. And you might actually want to look at a whole set of historic data records uh, to pull out any adverse events you might find in there. So the existing adverse event resource is at maturity level zero. Um, we ran a landscape map um, event where we got half a dozen uh, different systems in to take a look at what they were doing with adverse events. So um, FDA best, we had Epic Advara and Yale involved, uh, Red Cap were involved, 
um, a number of others. And they all went through and talked about what their experience was uh, of working with the existing level zero adverse event resource. The overall conclusion actually was it works fine, um, which was a little bit of a surprise, not quite what we thought. But then each of them admitted that they were actually providing uh, some extensions to the existing resource. So in the first Connectathon, uh, we did a tryout of exchanging data between vendor systems and, and, and back into the regulators, just to get some experience of how these things function. We collated the existing extensions that those systems that I was talking about were using. And we've had some additions made to the R5 adverse event resource. And they're currently looking at the spontaneous reporting and looking at any gaps that may exist between the current R4 resource uh, and the FDA MedWatch forms, which are there for spontaneous reporting. Um, R4 is going to be with us as the adverse event uh, resource for quite some time, even though it's only level zero. It's improved in R5. And one of the things that we are now doing is trying to provide some profiles on top of that uh, to help people distinguish between these two different contexts uh, of clinical care and, and clinical research. So what we've actually focused on is, is resource definitions and spontaneous reporting. Uh, we've still got um, a couple more areas that we need to dig into. Now, when it comes to digging into data, our newest project is, is really right in the, the forefront on this. So this one kicked off in, uh, in March of this year. Uh, so no connectathons as yet. Um, if you don't know what OMOP is, it's the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership. Uh, you can forget that. Nobody ever knows it. It's called OMOP. And it's essentially a much more clinically focused data model uh, than FIRE is. So the point behind uh, this work is that once you've got data into OMOP, taking it through into relational or one of the other analytic data sets is something that's well established. Uh, there's a whole set of tools out there which are already doing this work. What some places are doing at the moment is doing translations from FHIR into OMOP. And each institution is setting about doing that itself at the moment. There's a limited amount of standardization. And yet if you take the maps and look at them, you will find that they're, they're actually very similar. So the point behind this project is to try and produce a canonical form of this mapping um, so that we can go from this EHR into the analysis process. When we go into that analysis process, it actually takes us back to things like the adverse event reporting. When you've got data in a form that people are used to working with from an analytic perspective. And we're now talking about millions of records from hundreds of thousands of, of subjects. You stand a chance of finding adverse events you wouldn't otherwise see. And so you can get it out of your EHR via, via to OMOP and into your analytic form. So as I said, this project only started in March. So it's an early stage of collating all the existing mappings um, and working out what will constitute the, the base set of mappings that people want to work with. They then intend to go on and, and produce an IG from that, um, probably slightly different from any an IG in that it will have a standardized mapping as part of it. Um, that may need some tooling as well, but early days we, we will see. So the last project to talk about is electronic product information. Um, this one is, is really somewhat different from the others. So um, this is uh, Helen, I think she's called. Um, she's on a whole string of different medications and every single one she opens has a leaflet like this in it 
which tells her about all the bad things that might happen and what the correct dosage is and what she ought to do. And what she does with this data is that she writes it all down and puts it on a single piece of paper. And this is her single piece of paper for the 13 different medications that she's on. This is an entirely paper process at the moment. Um, you can't do anything with this other than read it. And there is a much larger project called Gravitate Health, um, which is a European Union project over a course of, I think, five years to look at providing this data on a much bigger scale. The EPI project is within Vulcan to uh, look at the, the individual fire resources and do the, the connectathon tracks to see what's feasible uh, and how to make these things function. So if we go and look here, this is work that's already been done. They've taken that, they've made it uh, something that can be translated. So we now have something that you can choose what language you want. This is Norwegian, this is English. You've got obviously the, the name of the drug uh, because it's a Norwegian drug, it's coming out the same. But the rest of the mechanics of this uh, are working through in a, a translatable form. Uh, well, big deal, you put the outsides of that um, very easily. But this is another view of it. So here we have uh, Helen or Maria or whatever she's called. Um, we can see she was elderly. Because we can structure the data, we can suppress the pregnancy warning. Because she's lactose intolerant, uh, we can pull out and emphasize the lactose intolerance part of it. So this is actually making this data much more uh, manipulable, much more processable than before. This is a project that really only touches this one little corner down here, but it's running through on a fairly aggressive timeline. Started off September 21, uh, they ran through some basic testing, um, and they've got a succession of tests that they're working through with the aim of an implementation guide um, early in next year. And if we summarize this through like the others, the, the first connectathon was just to kick off again to get things up and running, see how things work. They then built some specific profiles um, and they went through into something that was much more like a production mode in the most recent connectathon, they've been able to demonstrate uh, European, or in European language, um, US English, Japanese versions of the same data, and that all the fire resources will actually handle this. So it's a real confirmation that uh, a whole suite of different resources can be used in this way, and then they'll go on to produce their draft IG. So that's a, a quick gallop through the projects. Um, just to summarize, we, we started off um, with all of them up here as just ideas. Uh, they progressed through, there's a couple where we're still um, in the, the latter part of the early stages, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, once we've gone through that process, then they'll become formal age or seven. Uh, projects with a PSS um, and at least three of these projects and possibly four um, will go forward into 2023 with the aim of producing a, an implementation guide. So I put stars on this rather than the yellow boxes we had before. Um, you can see we've covered a number of different areas but We've not done anything on management, we've not done anything on the logistics area. Um, we've actually done quite a lot around the data capture and interpretation um, and scheduling parts of things and the analysis and submission. Um, we've not done anything about the storage and integration. Is that something that's a concern? Well, if we go back to the, the vision statement, what Vulcan sets out to do uh, is to bridge gaps. Um, 
where the stars are or where we could see gaps. There are projects going on about uh, subject recruitment. Um, there are projects going on around drug supply and accounting. Um, they're not areas which we have been told there is a gap. But we're always on the lookout for new gaps, new areas, new things that people can bring forward and say, yep, this is something that uh, we really uh, think something should be done about. And if you go to our Confluence site, uh, you can navigate to this use case submission form. So if you have any ideas of things that we ought to take a look at, um, please fill in one of the use case proposals. Um, we will actively consider that and, and may well be something that I'm talking about uh, in another two years time. And with that, um, I think I'm out of time and there's links uh, for you to be able to get in touch. I've not put links to some of the external things I've talked about. If you Google them, you'll find them straight away anyway. So um, there's no particular need to do that, I think. So thank you. And are there any questions? Yes, we do have some questions for you. Okay, so first question is from Jason. For sample data, have you looked at the Cynthia project for synthetic data? What gaps did it have? <laughs> it, it, yes, we have looked at Cynthia. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons I put lack of sample data in three times, because one of the problems with Cynthia as a set of data is it's really good. Um, real world data, has data items put in the wrong place. It's got gaps in it. It has things put in with the wrong date against them. That's sometimes what you need to be able to check that what you're doing and the way you're working things out is actually going to work. And if you go to a set of data which is generated from a series of algorithms, um, you can do volume testing. You can look for instances of things that you think are there. What you're probably not going to find is any guidance on what to do when data is missing and the sort of weird things that actually happen in real life. So what I should like to have in the long term is a suite of different sets of sample data. Uh, Cynthia would be one of those, and possibly a variant of Cynthia built more around a specific clinical research. Um, but also um, obfuscated sets of really, really, really real world data, um, warts and all, so that we've got something that we can play with. Okay. Next question is from Jen. For the RWD project, has the team since explored possible use of the Cynthia synthetic data creation tool as a potential source of sample test data? Well, I think that's, I think I answered that one in, yeah. in one <laughs> sense. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's certainly a positive direction that we, we do need to look at. Okay, question from Lee. Is the EPI project related to FDA structured product labeling SPL effort at all? Um, yes and no. Um, it's the EPI project started from a European base. Uh, so from that perspective, it did not start from the SPL projects. Um, but the FDA are keeping watch on what is going on. And another reason I didn't mention for the involvement in Vulcan is it, it actually allows us to get some FDA input or US input to something that is otherwise a European project because that, that we can do through Vulcan to be a little more difficult to do through, through a European project. Um, the content that we are dealing with um, 
in the EPI project is, is in many ways similar uh, to what's going on in SPL. Uh, and there is some work to think about moving SPL across into fire. If that happens, then you'll be hard pressed to tell the difference between that work and what's been going on in the EPI work. So nothing formal, but informally, yes, there's a close correspondence, I think. A uh, question here from Samantha. Do you have any upcoming projects addressing the pain points in patient recruitment? No, but if you would like to suggest one, we'd be very happy to think about it. <clears throat> that is all the questions I have in Hoover right now. If you are live there at uh, Dev Days in Cleveland, you can post your questions now. Um, we do have a few minutes left here. If you are online and you'd like to ask your question live, you can either unmute yourself now or raise your hand and I will unmute you. Yeah, hi, thanks. I just wanted to follow up on the sample data. Yesterday there was a call about um, converting the MIMIC data set, uh, so MIMIC 3 or MIMIC 4 um, into Fire. And I was just wondering if you've also looked at that because that, that I think is an, you know, de-identified, so I don't know if it is sufficient for your purposes or not, but I just was curious if you had thoughts on it. Um, I'm sorry, remind me what the MIMIC set of data is. Um, yeah, so it, it's um, a set of real data that's been de-identified and released uh, for authorized users um, or credentialed users that you can get access to. I think it's from the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospitals. Right. I, I think that sort of data set is, is going to be useful. Yes, we have looked at some of that. Um, I think the biggest issue in, in terms of dealing with that, to be honest, has been sufficient time to, to get to grips with it and really start to work with it. Um, we've had offers of some similar sort of large data sets uh, from, from some of our vendors and also th uh, through NCI. Um, so yeah, uh, the more of those sorts of data we can get, the, the more opportunities we have to go off and look for things. Um, I'm not sure that we've specifically looked at that one though. Yeah, I, th I, th I thought it was interesting. So we, I work at IBM and we've, we've, we've used that internally to some degree within our Watson Health business and then I went, I attended a call yesterday and there's someone in the community that uh, uh, has been working with the creators of that Mimic data set and just like yesterday released a fire translation of it. So it, right. it has never been available in fire format externally, I think. Um, right. But, okay. That, that, yeah. that is, do you know, did they, did they, did they build their own um, translation from source into fire? Yes. Yep, they did. And uh, so, so you can look up that talk if you want. I, I don't I have no affiliation with it, uh, except that I was interested because we've done something similar internally. Yeah. So, yeah. No, that's useful. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We have one minute left if anyone else would like to unmute and ask a question or if you are in the room and like to post one. Mm -hmm. 